questions when it comes to hair and hair color and water temperature. So our first question is, what is the ideal water temperature to help with keeping color from fading when I wash my hair? Yeah, I think the hair temperature thing um, always comes up when people talking about, uh, you always hear your stylist say, oh, do you want me to rinse with cold water? It'll make your hair shinier. Um, that is actually a, a myth. Temperature will not make your hair shinier. There have been, believe it or not, a, a couple studies actually done on that, or maybe one study that I know of. Um, so that one is a myth, but what is not a myth is that hair color can be impacted by the temperature of water. So maybe your hair won't be shinier, but your hair color can be impacted whether you use hot or cold water. When you have hot water, things tend to be solubilized more readily, right? So you have these dyes in your hair shaft and you're in the shower and you're pouring hot water all over them. Those uh, dyes that are in your hair shaft will solubilize more easily in the hot water than in the cold water. Hot water, the molecules are moving around very quickly and uh, they'll help solubilize the dyes faster. So when you hear rinse with lower temperature water or as low a temperature as you can stand, that really is true and important to do in preserving your hair color. Um, I don't think you have to do ice cold. I just think, uh, you know, the warmest you can, or on the colder side, the warmest temperature you can tolerate versus the hottest warmest uh, would definitely be better in keeping the dye molecules in your hair and not going down your bath drain. That sounds good. So as far as helping with color fadage, just less shampooing in general is best, right? Yeah, people always say, oh, how can I preserve my hair color? Uh, get it wet the least amount. So ideally, you know, use water as little as possible. And when you are using it, make sure that you're using as tepid water as possible. I don't have a, an exact degree because even in my own shower, I'm not like bringing a thermometer in there. Although I like probably could. Uh, I like my water really hot, but I also um, don't color my hair. So um, yeah. I think there's a collective sigh from all people who have been turning their water on cold to get that extra yeah. shiny hair. Just turn so. it on warm. <laughs> that sounds good. And get some yeah. dry shampoo, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so next question. I think this is a great one just for the fact that we're, we're still in summer, but we're coming off summer. And I know we've had a very interesting year. It's not been typical, but it, we have been having some extra hot days lately and oh, yeah. hair tends to get it dry. Like 20 where I lived yesterday. Very yeah. hot. Yeah. Record breaking. I know. Yeah. I was hiding, but some people are outdoors, anywho, but as far as helping to kind of add additional moisture and get the cuticle to have some more hydration, I know in our episode, we talked a lot about the three main components of hair, cuticle being the, a big topic for that episode. Does leave-in conditioner truly help and what do we recommend for leave-in conditioners as far as just helping it rehab the hair a bit? Yeah, so I think when your hair is feeling dry, the most important thing that you can do is um, add lubrication to it and add some kind of insulating layer to prevent moisture from moving in and out of the hair. I think that thing is the most important. And it also helps it, everything feel um, really good. So you can uh, just use a really good conditioner that does a lot of depositing on the hair or you can use uh, something like Super Skinny Serum, uh, which is uh, a product in the Paul Mitchell line, or you can use like a leave-in-based cream treatment. I think the important thing is to use something to prevent um, interaction of your hair with the environment. And that should really help, especially if you plan on combing or brushing or moving your fingers mm -hmm. through is having that lubrication on the hair. That sounds good. I love using the lavender mint leave-in spray and myself personally, I have curly hair, so it always wants more moisture. But my sister, she has completely different hair than me and she, it's pretty light and it's been through tons of different processes and she loves it for just to give her hair kind of like what we're talking about, giving that moisture needed to add some shine back in and manageability. So that's another good one to try. Mm -hmm. So this is a good question. And I think this kind of goes along with a lot of things that we talk about when it comes to formulating and hair color. So what is some differences between fine versus thin hair? 
Yeah, I think when we're talking fine, like fine, medium, coarse, that is a texture correlation. And when you're talking thin hair, I don't think um, at least we shouldn't be assuming that that is the uh, diameter of your fiber. Um, fineness is um, texture and then thinness is really like how many hairs do you have all over your head? So if you're thinning, you're like missing hairs. It doesn't necessarily mean your hair is getting skinnier in diameter. Perfect. And we're going to talk a little bit about that different texture and formulating in just a few minutes. But for those of you just tuning in, you're joining with myself, Jen Montoya Palmore and Valerie George. And we are the chemist and the colorist. Val's the chemist. I'm the colorist. And we're here answering all your questions live including questions that came in over the weekend through our social media page. So if you have any questions, please use the chat in order to address those and we will get to those. And if for some reason you tune in late and you think of a question, we can always go back and visit that chat and be able to answer any of your questions later. All right, Val, so let's talk a little bit more about what we just were discussing as far as that fine, fine hair versus medium or coarse hair. So a lot of times with formulation, I know that we get the question all the time in our trainings that we have that we need to maybe consider different developer choices to help give that additional lightning or sometimes we need to choose a different developer when we're lifting natural pigment when working with a permanent hair color. So I have some examples. Can I show you Val? These are yeah. some things that I train with. These are my exciting cuticle layers. I know that we talked a lot about our different cuticle fun, yeah. diameters. So this would be fine hair and you can see how it's very soft and a little flimsy in a sense. And then you have your coarse hair and it's very, very thick and, and coarse. It's very durable. Yeah. This has been through the ringer. I've literally traveled all over the nation with these cuticle layers in my suitcase. So you can see the course has held up a little better than the fine, but I know that with developer choice, let's talk about permanent color first. Um, I always mention in trainings for color, when you're thinking about how many levels of lift, you're going to depend, it's dependent on that choice when picking your developer. And then when working with lightener, it's how fast you wanna lift and that decides your developer choice. When it comes to permanent hair color, what are some rules of thumb when it's coming to maybe more of that finer hair versus coarse hair? Do we need to alter that a bit? Yeah, well, we talked a little bit about hair structure in episode two of Chemist and the Colorist, our new show on YouTube, where we talked about what fine, medium, and coarse means. And it has to do with the amount of uh, cuticle layers on the hair fiber and how big the fiber is in diameter. So um, fine hair, in your example there uh, appeared to be more flimsy because there were less cuticle layers on it in real life. I don't know if it's flimsier, but it definitely has less cuticle layers in real life. And then medium hair has more cuticle layers and coarse has um, lots of cuticle layers. So um, when you are talking about lightning and when you're talking about coloring, you kind of want to get the cortex out of the way and you want to get mm -hmm. to the inside of the hair where the melanin is living. And the more cuticle layers you have, the harder it is to do that, right? The goal is to get into the cortex. So I definitely recommend considering the guest texture of hair, is it fine, medium, or coarse when choosing your developer level. In permanent color, I never recommend going more than 20 volume because even with coarse hair, um, I don't think you need it. There's other things that you can do. And I'll tell you about that in a second. And I'll hold my finger up to remember that. Uh, but then with um, permanent color, when you use more than 20 volume, you start to oxidize even the dyes within the color base. And that's not a good thing. You impact the end result. So with color, I never go more than 20 just based on that principle. I'm, I never go more than 20. I'm not a stylist. <laughs> I don't do hair. I'm like, I never use more than 20. Um, <laughs> I'm just a chemist, but if I were a stylist, um, and I definitely even recommend to you guys, like you should mm -hmm. not use more than 20 um, on a normal basis on even very coarse, stubborn hair, um, just because those dyes can uh, start to uh, disintegrate within the hydrogen peroxide developer. But with lightning, yeah, up the developer, uh, take into consideration your guest canvas or instead of upping the developer, use a different bleach like a nine plus um, lightener, which bleaches very quickly 
it is able to just um, bust that hair open and get in there. If you have um, coarse hair versus fine hair, yeah, upping your developer, I think is kind of like an easy way to go. Is it the best for the hair fiber? Mm, not really, uh, just because the more uh, peroxide level that you use, uh, the more damage that you're going to get to the hair. So there are things that you can do. I know certain color brands um, promote putting like just the dye on the hair, letting it sit to allow just the dyes to penetrate in and then applying a second dye mixture that's mixed with hydrogen peroxide on the hair um, and that will develop. You can pre-treat the hair with a low volume of hydrogen peroxide. I know that's something a lot of stylists do as well. They'll put like a five or 10 volume uh, straight on the guest's hair. I don't recommend going higher than that for safety reasons um, to kind of bust the hair open. I don't prefer that because, um, well, the hydrogen peroxide is damaging to the hair fiber. Uh, so there are tricks you can do besides just upping your developer. But the moral of the story is, uh, you know, I don't know what's right or wrong. It depends on the guest's hair. The moral of the story is if you have fine hair, you have less cuticle layers. If you have coarse hair, you typically have more cuticle layers and you need a different methodology to get in there and do what you need to do, whether it's coloring or lightening. I think as far as formulating with permanent hair color and how you're mentioning the fine to coarse and how you can adapt that a bit to that particular texture, a couple of things to keep in mind for formulating when, it work, when you're working with finer hair is if you're really wanting to avoid over deposit, it's great to formulate a half shade to a shade lighter to help prevent too much deposit, especially around the baby fine hairs around the face, especially with fine hair, that's really where it's going to pick up the color. Yeah. And then even sometimes I recommend if you, because believe it or not, when it comes to gray hair, even though the person may have baby fine hair, it still can be coarse. So if the concern is over deposits in that front area, I always mention start in the back and work your way so it's not on the longest in the front. So sometimes that can avoid any over deposit or formulating a little lighter. When it comes to coarse hair, and I agree, I think sometimes it's just changing it up a bit. How can you add more pigment? So it's almost like the opposite. You can formulate a half to a shade darker on that coarser hair to help accommodate for more space within that diameter. and. And therefore you won't really need to deal with changing your developer. And that's a trick I use a lot in the salon is dropping my developer. And I use a, a level six on one of my guests who I actually am intending for her to look like a level seven. And I use 20 volume and it, it comes out like a level seven because her hair is coarse and it ends up looking beautiful. So those are some great tips. When it comes to lightener, I think it's just, you really have to use your expertise and going back to that rule of thumb of how fast am I wanting to lift? I know yep. when I have a level one or two, I need to get that high lift in there. I, I do go with a higher volume. When I'm yeah, with my finer. Get, get through that hair. Mm -hmm. Especially with that melanin, that it just can get so stubborn, even if it's virgin hair, it's yep. still stubborn. But so I hope those are some great tips that can help you out. I think we have a question yep. that I'll you see um, on the chat. Let's see. Yeah, all right. Somebody says, um, I think it's Jasmine asks, how do I determine what temperature to set my flat iron? I have curly, but fine hair. Love this series. Well, thank you, Jasmine. We love it too. I'm glad you like it. Uh, that is actually a great question. And I um, am looking down because I, I wanted to type in and specifically pull up a year so I don't quote it incorrectly, but there was a study done in 2009 and another one done in 2013 that specifically looked at what temperature should you be setting um, your flat irons to. And interestingly enough, one of the studies found that if you use a lower temperature on your hair, um, and this is for straightening, not for curling. Um, if you use a lower temperature on your flat iron and do more passes on the hair, you get a more longevity effect of smoothing than if you did really hot temperatures and fewer passes. So a lot of people think, oh, let me set this baby to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which by the way, hair starts to melt at like 420. So I think it's like crazy when people, uh, you know, put their stuff so hot. Um, heat is incredibly damaging to hair. And, but a lot of people think, oh, it'll be better if I just turn it boiling hot and like, you know, 
melt my hair to get it smooth. Uh, when this study actually shows lower the temperature, do more passives, and you'll get more progressive straightening um, of your hair over time, which I thought was, um, was pretty cool. Yeah, heat is one of like the worst things you could do for your hair. So the lower the heat you can do, the better long-term. It's Especially also great to fine hair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think those are great points because we always teach it, especially when working with direct dyes, more importantly, because the hair is already compromised in a sense, but it goes along with oxidative dye as well as yeah. where there's heat, there's escape. So we always try to make sure to educate our, our trainers to educate the world. And then on like for my own clients, and I know for other hairdressers, we need to educate our clients on how hot their tools should be because I know we've all seen the fried chicken when they've come in and they're I, like, I'm the world's biggest hypocrite. I put my iron on 450. I'm like, I don't got time for this. And I just like do it, <laughs> you know, so but it's passing? not good for your hair. It's like a doctor who smokes, right? You're like, <laughs> no, you shouldn't be doing it, but you are. That's me, but with a flat iron. Well, I think we all do that. When we know kind of what we're doing, we push the envelope a little bit. I know I have, but yeah. it's just helpful with keeping that, that tool cooler. Yeah. Well, one one more point on that you mentioned the dyes um so when you are um applying heat to your hair your hair contains a natural content of water and it has to do with uh the ambient water in the atmosphere like what's the humidity outside what's the humidity in your hair but there's also water that always permanently lives in the hair. it's called crystalline water and when you put this flat iron on your hair you're heating the water up and we all learned in like elementary school what temperature water boils, right? 212, yep. we're setting our irons to 400. So this water starts to boil and evaporate into gas and it doesn't have anywhere to go. It's trapped in the hair and it's going to explode out of the cuticle. I wish I could show you some photos we have. Uh, we took photos of a skin uh, with a scanning electron microscope of the hair. So it's like super close up and you can actually see where um, the hair has just exploded from the water trying to escape. So it's bad for your hair in that way. And then if you're coloring your hair um, and even your natural pigment, uh, melanin is pretty heat stable, um, but these artificial colorants that you're using, um, whether they're oxidative or even direct dyes are not heat stable. So if you apply that amount of heat on it, eventually they will degrade and some are less heat stable than others. Like I've seen people that have dyed their hair like a violet and they've done a flat iron over it and the dye literally just disappears because it's not heat stable um, whatsoever. That's good to know. So, I yeah. definitely am gonna talk to my clients about what you just mentioned about the hair exploding. I've yeah. had that happen to at least two. I can I'm gonna give you a now. photo so they can see it close up and just be like, this yeah. is hair on a flat iron. Yeah. You know, we could probably pop it into the chat. I, like afterwards, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that. All right. Okay. Cool. I think we have another question, another live question. Ooh. Sam asks, any tips to achieve the most lift with uninsulated lightning? Jen, you're going to have to explain what that means. Um, Let me specifically skylight, which is a clay lightener that we have at Paul Mitchell Professional Color. I typically can't get more than three-ish levels of lift when open air processing. That's a great question. I think it's really common when we're working with open air lighteners. I, it definitely, this is going to be a time where you're going to up your mm -hmm. developer. I almost always, unless you're trying to get more, if you're working with maybe like four levels, five levels, I would say go to 30. You have control. You can keep in mind, you know, how many levels you're going to get with that. But if you're looking for the maximum of up to seven with Skylight and that, how it offers that, then two things are really, actually three things are gonna be really important. Number one, mixing. You wanna 100% me measure your developer. That's going to give you the most perfect balance in order to lighten. The second thing is to really get your uh, application on nice and thick. So think, you, think Snowy Mountain, very yummy frosted cupcake where you see mm. more product than hair. If you, if you see any hair peeking through with that application, you need to layer more product on. The reason why is you want that because it's open air and same rule apply to open or for clay lighteners. As soon as it starts to dry out, it stops lifting. So we wanna make sure that it stays damp as long as possible. And then finally, the third thing is just as far as having that 40 volume, that 40 volume is going to take the place of incubation. 
So that's really going to help. So those three things should give you a little bit more lift. And then also just making sure you're using the right tool for the job. Because if there's somebody who has a lot of previous hair color on the hair, especially from the mid shaft to the ends, you can imagine how old some of this color could be. And you may need something a little bit stronger, such as an up to nine level, and you would still be able to hand paint with that. However, you would need some material in order to keep it separated because the skylight is designed to have no transfer where a more traditional lightener is not designed that way, but you still can do some type of hand painting technique with it in order to get some of those additional layers of color removed, if that's the case. So just understanding what's living in the hair. If it's virgin hair, skylight is great, even with some previously colored hair, but you just want to know the history of how much previous color lives on that hair. Yep, skylight is uh, meant to dry out, as you mentioned, Jen, because uh, you don't want to use, well, when we made it, uh, we were directed, we want to be able to just freehand, not worry about foils, not worry about thingies that you put in between. And so mm -hmm. it's meant to dry out a little bit. And when uh, bleaches dry out, the lifting starts to slow down or totally stop. And that's because you need the water from the developer that you poured in to start to break down the persulfates. Like when bleach is a powder, it's inert. It's not reacting with anything. Once you get water on bleach, um, the persulfates start to dissolve and that's when they start to act. And so if the water goes away because it, it dried out into the air or went into clay, uh, the persulfates don't have anything to dissolve them. So you need to keep the hair moist um, to keep it going. Or as Jen said, a uh, switch to a bleach where you uh, really need more lift for the guest. I love it. Thank you, Val. I think I saw another question. Let me just pop it open really quick. Ooh. Okay, question. Kim asks, my hair is the same as Jen's when doing my base or roots, maybe a six to eight color should I use six six to eight in or should I have some warmth added to that mix since my blonde is warm almost identical to Jen's well I think uh, it would depend what color line right my thing one thing I will say is although my hair appears to be warm I actually use ashes to achieve that so I control the warmth versus adding it I have a natural level five and right away that dominant pigment that's living in my hair is pretty much sitting at a nice red. And it, the red, it's funny because it's really easy to lift until I get to that orangey level. I'd say probably you hit about seven, eight, and then it's like a slow roll. So for me, I, um, I need to control warmth. So I've been using the NA series from Paul Mitchell, the color for many years, if I'm doing my base, but recently I've stopped doing my base and I just have been highlighting. Uh, the last time I highlighted, I actually use secret lift plus and toned with Crema XG and I use the PA series. So that's actually a oh, very good cool. base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's faded a little, but this is, you know, it's been a minute now. I have definitely have COVID hair, but uh, I'm embracing it. I'm all good with it. I haven't really been in the sun too much because I'm not a sun bunny. So uh, yeah. it's, it appears to look more beigey in person, but those are some things that I use in order to control the warmth. So if I were to use an, a straight end on my hair, I might have a little more warmth than I desire. So I definitely would recommend if you don't want to fully cool it down and control 100%, add some in into a, an ash of some sort to help cool it down just enough. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and that's just using basic color theory, right? Which I think yep. is one topic that we'll cover on the chemist and the colorist. Mastering color theory is like super important um, to being able to do color really well. And it takes the anxiety of, out of a lot of stuff. So I can't wait until we get to that episode on the road. One day. Yeah. I know we have some in the, in the can to film soon, but I think if just some, uh, general color theory to help you along the way before we mm -hmm. have our episode is get familiar with the color wheel or color map where the tonal series live in that. And that will really mm -hmm. identify what's in the tube. It takes the guesswork out. And anything that goes across that color wheel or color map is going to neutralize and cancel. Anything near it will enhance or intensify. So those are some quick, easy color theory to help you along a little bit, but 
just know that the law of color works. It's designed for us. It's truly the roadmap. So it's really helpful. And it's a law. You can't change laws, at least not scientific laws. You can change uh, laws in your uh, <laughs> governmental communities, but you can't change laws of science. Once they're laws, it's like a factoid. You can't change it. I always think of gravity. What comes up, goes up, must come down. <laughs> the law of gravity. You can't, you can't change that, right? So the law it. of color theory is it works. It's based on science. So can't wait to cover that. Yeah. Me too. We have about five minutes left and I just wanted to get to maybe one more question that mm -hmm. seems to be a constant question that we get is when working with previously colored hair, uh, what is the rule of thumb? We know it to be hair color doesn't lift color. So it doesn't lift yeah. artificial color. That's something so, I'd say hair color doesn't lift color. Okay. Yep. We always say that. So I think that is sometimes a challenge where there's a lot of different myths around, like you can use a high lift on a level six and previously color level six and higher, but you can't lift something lower than a six. But I have been doing color for 23 years and I've never had success with color or trying to lift color. You can deposit, but I always mention in trainings when talking about this, that when you're putting permanent hair color over previously colored hair, you're now swelling the cuticle and gain structural swelling really for nothing because you're not changing anything. That melanin's replaced already. Yeah. Is that is there any more that you can add to that to help our, our viewers? Yeah, well, let me just tell you my theoretical thoughts on this. So when you are applying more hair color, even if it's a high lift, to somebody who already has colored hair, you are creating that swelling environment, but you're also adding um, more dye. Even if it's a high lift, you have a tiny bit of color in there. You also could be oxidizing any uncoupled dye from the previous session that's still living in the hair. So you can get a slightly different color result than you intended. Additionally, the lightening capability of a high lift, like unless you're using 40 volume is really not that much. Like you're talking like a level or two with just 20 volume peroxide. And in that case, like you really should be using lightener to lighten. It's way more effective, even at a 10 volume, doing less damage to the hair. Um, you can achieve more levels of lift. Um, now, if you just want a little bump to the hair and you just want to kind of whoop, brighten everything up a little, like, yeah, I, I could envision getting away with a high lift, but it's not enough to like lift previous color out of the hair. And in fact, it's not really enough to like lift melanin out of the hair. Like you're going to get a bump but again, you're not going to get very far because the mechanism of ammonia and hydrogen peroxide working synergistically, like it does do a little bleaching, but it's not great. That's why we invented bleach in my mind. Exactly. That's exactly what we try to guide people with just so they can have a little bit more understanding. And that's when it's best to reach for your lightener and then have the ability to tone and refine after. So hope yeah. that helps a little bit. But Val, let's not let our viewers know that they kind of help shape the future of our episodes. So yeah. through their comments. And if you, once you're finished watching an episode, comment below and let us know what you're looking to see in the future. What are your burning questions? That way we can start a list for our next episode, which launches on October 5th, which is actually my brother's birthday. That's exciting. I'll, I won't forget that day. And Happy just know we other we gave you an know. episode. <laughs> we're giving you an episode yeah but we have um every time we have our episode launch the next day we have our live just like this to follow up and answer all of the questions we've received so looking forward to it as always val thank you so much for your time you're always so fun to work with and i absolutely love joining forces with you yeah thank you for your stylist insight it definitely takes two perspectives and thanks to everyone for watching and supporting our show and asking us these great questions Thank you all. See you soon.